your host, Aaron Heath. I'd like to take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to Episode 90 of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. You can find the show notes by going to gunrightsintexas.com slash 090. I remember a time when you had statesmen and you had politicians. A statesman was somebody, they went, they represented the people. A politician was someone who, their career was politics. It seems like we have so few politicians nowadays, or so few statesmen nowadays, and more politicians. And it's, it's saddening, really. However, politicians have always feared the public being armed. And recently, I purchased a lever action. It's a Marlin 1895 and 4570 government. And it made me think of the... Uh, It made me think of, in 1864, the governor of Ohio petitioned the Secretary of War to prevent the sale of Henry rifles to the public. You see, he feared that uh, he would face an uprising of draft dodgers armed with these rifles, supposedly. Now, I'm certain that the local, as they called them, Indians, now they call them Native Americans, and criminal elements at the time were probably mentioned in the request as well. If not, that was kind of hinted at, I'm certain. Now, the War Department, being true to being a true to form at that time, stated there was nothing they could do because the Henry was not a contract item. And I'll throw in a link to the article where you can actually read about this. However, you can find that article if you don't want to look at the show notes by going to rarewinchesters.com. Now, I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you where to find the show, and after that, well, we'll come back and we'll move on to listener feedback. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now, I've narrowed down the listener feedback in from the two weeks, actually a little more than two weeks, down to two emails that I felt were important. Now, I didn't get permission to quote their emails from, uh, from each of the authors, so I'm just going to paraphrase both of them. William wrote in to say that he was having trouble with episodes 88 and 89 when he pauses and resumes. Now, after some research, and I've emailed him about it, it turns out that there is a problem associated either in the software or the libraries used by the software that, are, that actually do the encoding of the file into an MP3 format. This all came about because I recently wiped my computer clean and did a reinstall from scratch. Now, William also pointed out that the taxation without representation happened before the actual revolution, and that's true. But that was one of the things that led into it, and it was an important consideration. When somebody says our founding fathers would have already been shooting, there are a lot of factors that that are not in play at this time that were at that time. There are a lot of grievances that our founding fathers had when they did start shooting that we don't have today. But William does point out that it was the actual attempt to confiscate arms that started the shooting war, which we call the Revolutionary War. And that also supports my position that our founding fathers would not have been shooting already. Moving on, Sheila wrote in to say that she is a member of the LGBTQ community. Now, she doesn't expand on exactly what part of that community she's a member of, but she wanted to let me know that, or she wanted to let me know about Operation Blazing Sword. She said that Operation Blazing Sword is an effort to put gun rights activists together with members of the LGBTQ community that are, well, interested in learning about firearms. It is made up of gun rights activists who provide 100% free first-time shooting experiences to the members, or two members of the LGBTQ community in order to teach them basic firearms handling and to educate them that guns can be handled safely while providing them a means to protect themselves. And I'll include a link in the show notes to it because this is something that I see it, well, how do you, how's the best way to put it? There's an old parable or a proverb or whatever you want to call it. You give a man to fish, he'll eat for a day. You teach a man to fish, he'll eat for a lifetime. Well, you can do what OCT offered and stand guard for events or... You can teach these people that are being targeted and oppressed to defend themselves and they can guard themselves much better than you can because you cannot be there all the time. And that's why 
programs like Operation Blazing Sword have my approval, where operations or programs like Open Carry Texas and there, we will have a co-rally with an organization if they ask us to, because we can get in trouble if we actually stand there and provide free security. Well, in all honesty, I not only give Operation Blazing Sword a thumbs up, it's an intriguing it's an intriguing program, and I think people need to get involved. Now, I'm going to run the audio clip that tells you how to find the show on social media. And then when we come back, we're going to hit our uh, topic, which is Killing Spree Zones. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook. You can follow it on Twitter. You can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social. Now, I have I have always been opposed to gun-free zones, as they're called. But recently, I came to a realization. They're not actually gun-free zones. Because the bad guy has no problem bringing a gun in. A bad guy has no, no real prohibition on carrying a gun in. What we do see as a problem is... Good guys cannot carry their guns because they're good guys. They obey the rules. They obey the law. And that means gun-free zones are actually killing spree zones. They are free-range killing spree zones because they are self-defense prohibition zones. You find a gun-free zone and you will find that you may have a gangster in there packing heat because he's afraid that other gangsters will find him there. Maybe you'll have a wannabe Somebody that wants to be famous and the way they think they can get famous is to kill a bunch of people. Or maybe you will find that you have somebody in a gun-free zone, supposed gun-free zone, and they're there to commit an act of terror. But whatever it is, you will find that when you boil it down to its most simple, pure, unadulterated form, gun-free zones are nothing but either property owner sanctioned or government sanctioned killing spree zones. Now, I did some research. I I actually limited myself to I believe it was 1980 and newer and I took and looked at the top 10 spree killings or mass murders that involve firearms. Now the rule was it could have multiple scenes, but it would all have to happen as in one day as one event. It had to be after 1980 and I really didn't put a minimum limit on the number of people killed because I knew I could find enough examples of people being killed in gun-free zones that I could easily exceed the, uh, well, I could easily exceed the FBI's requirement of four and get 10 easy. And this isn't because gun rights are evil or guns are evil and we need to ban guns. No, it's because we need to ban killing spree zones. Let's take a look at the most recent and the, uh, and the most deadly. Now, I'm certain more people will pass away from injuries they sustained. This happens all the time. When somebody gets shot, they live a few years and then they'll pass away. At the time I recorded this and actually worked on the show notes, we had 49 dead and 53 injured. Now, under Florida law, the Orlando, Florida killings at the uh, at the Pulse nightclub were done in a gun-free zone. Now, how did this end? This ended when law enforcement finally decided they had enough people that they went in, and now you got to keep in mind, people, law enforcement is made up of people with guns, but they went in and they killed the attacker. Now, there are mixed reports. We're not going to cover those, that maybe some of the dead were attributable to law enforcement ammunition rather than the killer's ammunition. But in reality, this is all because the killer went in, took hostages, killed a bunch of people, and tried, he tried his best to kill as many people as he possibly could before being stopped. Moving on to the second deadliest shooting, we have the shooting at Virginia Tech, which left 32 dead, 17 injured, and this particular instance not only happened in a gun-free zone, but it led to a movement. It led to the concealed campus movement. Now, this shooting ended when the shooter committed suicide after law enforcement, once again, these are people with guns, entered the building that he was in. Now, I'd like to point out a few things about the shooting that we know about already, or that we know, have known about for a while. The shooter waited 30 days between purchasing firearms. 
He passed background checks due to incomplete data. He would have been a prohibited person if the data had been submitted like the law required. But he didn't. Uh, he didn't fail because the information was not submitted. Now let's move on to Sandy Hook. I was actually in, in a vehicle on the road when this one happened. And this is one that all the gun banners thought would lead to a mass turn-in or confiscation of firearms and making the entire United States a killing spree zone. We had 27 dead, most of them children, two injured, and yes, it happened in a killing spree zone or a gun-free zone. It ended once law enforcement, once again, people with guns, went in to confront the killer. You see, he committed suicide in this case. Now, he didn't pass any background checks. He didn't buy the guns legally. He stole the weapons that he used after, uh, after he killed his mother. Now, think about that. This guy was so messed up. He killed his mother and then stole her guns. Moving on, we're going to go back in time to 1991, October 16th. There were 23 dead, 27 injured in Colleen, Texas. Now, this was a shooting at Luby's Cafeteria. Yes, this happened in a gun-free zone. You see, at that time, Texas was, the st entire state of Texas was essentially a gun-free zone unless you were on somebody's property. If you were on their property, then they could carry, but you couldn't. Now, the shooting ended with, uh, with the shooter committing suicide after law enforcement, once again, people with guns, engaged him. Now, this shooting did lead to the state of Texas establishing the concealed carry program that has now become the license to carry. Oh, man, I'm, I'm not sure how to, how to go about mentioning all these because a lot of these just make me angry looking at them and realizing almost all of them could have been prevented or at least limited in the scope because if somebody would have confronted the shooter while being armed. Let's move on to San Isidro, California. This one happened, let's see, July 18th, 1984. You had 21 dead, 19 injured, and this was this is often called the San Isidro McDonald's Massacre. Now, yes, this did happen in a virtual uh, gun-free zone because while California issued carry licenses, they were a they were issued strictly on a May issue basis, and the odds of coming across somebody that had one were about the same as getting struck by lightning. Actually, you probably had a better chance of getting struck by lightning. Now. Some people will say, well, California had open carry back then. Yeah, they did. And it was unloaded only. So if somebody would have been open carrying in San Isidro, Wal or not Walmart, but McDonald's, the shooter would have seen them, and maybe he wouldn't have shot the place up. Or maybe he would have. Maybe he would have went somewhere else. Or maybe he would have waited till they left. But it didn't stop him from carrying his firearm and at least having it loaded long enough to shoot people. <sighs> now this... this particular event ended when law enforcement, once again, people with guns, killed the attacker. I'd also like to point out that this is the second deadliest shooting where the attacker was killed by police rather than committing suicide when confronted by armed opponents. Moving on, San Bernardino, California happened in December 2nd, or on December 2nd of 2015. This one, we saw 14 dead, 24 injured. And yes, once again, it was a killing spree zone. This time, it not only was in California, which Pretty much the same thing applied to this one as the last time, except even unloaded open carry is illegal now. But it happened on federal property, which means no firearms, period. And yet, the shooters still brought guns. Now, this particular shooting ended with law enforcement, once again, people with guns killing the attacker. And yes, it's classified as a terrorist attack. Now, let's go back in time to August 16, 1986. We're going to Edmond, Oklahoma, and we're going to go visit their post office. Now, in this post office, a, I believe it was a former postal employee, he showed up, killed 14, injured 6, and yeah, once again, it was a gun-free zone because, like Texas, at this time, Arkansas only allowed law enforcement to carry. The entire state was a virtual gun-free zone. Now, some people say, well, the, fed, the post office is federal property. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure, but I'm relatively certain that this shooting was part of what led to the Federal Gun-Free Zones Act, or what led to gun-free zones being made federal on federal property. I'm not 100% sure, but I'm certain. But it did lead to the 
it was one of the events that led the post office to banning firearms on postal property. I do know that. I'd also like to point out that the shooter committed suicide after law enforcement, once again, these are people with guns, arrived, but he killed himself before they entered the building. Also, the shooting was one of several that led to the term going postal. Now, we're going to go forward in time. We're going to go forward to November 5th, 2009. This is another shooting I can tell you where I was when it happened. I was at home. I was at home, and the reason I can tell you where I was when it happened, my sister and my two nephews were actually, they were actually at Fort Hood. My brother-in-law, I be, if I remember correctly, was deployed to Iraq. Might have been Afghanistan, but he was deployed. They were living in, on ba- my sister, my brother-in-law, and my nephews were living in on-base housing. And there were 13 dead, 32 injured. And yeah, this happened at a gun-free zone. Military, it's, it was a U.S. military base, meaning federal property. And the, the shooter... He was captured after he was confronted by law enforcement, once again, people with guns, and they shot it out, leaving him wounded where he could, was able to be captured alive. In fact, if I'm not mistaken, this is the only one or one of two where the suspect actually was captured alive that's on this list. And I'm certain he tried to go out in a blaze of glory. Now, this particular event is classified as a terrorist attack, in my opinion. I and mean, when you have somebody... When you have somebody make it clear that their religion plays a part in this and they're doing it to cause terror, yeah, it's a terrorist attack. I don't care if it's uh, Christian, Muslim, Jew, Hindu, Buddhist. If somebody's planning to use their religion as a basis to commit murder, they're a terrorist. They're nothing but a terrorist. Let's turn back the clock a little more than 10 years before Fort Hood. We'll go back to April 20th, 1999. This would be Columbine, Colorado. We, we know that 13 were killed, 21 were injured, and this was a gun-free zone. Now, the shooters committed suicide while law enforcement, once again, these are people with guns, waited outside. Now, the shooting, in this case, popularized school shootings. Now, this is, this is extremely upsetting to me because I can't get all the information on this one partially because I don't have time to look it up, and partially because a lot of it just doesn't seem to be there. And I know I'm going to mispronounce the name, but Binghamton, New York, this was April 3rd, 2009. We had 13 dead and four injured. And this one is, this one's only behind Columbine because of the injured. In reality, because of the dead, they're tied. And this happened just 17 days before Columbine. Once again, it's an un- While it's unconfirmed from my research, according to John Lott's website, it was a gun-free zone. The shooting ended when the shooter heard the sirens of law enforcement, these are people with guns, and then he committed suicide. Now, when the law enforcement showed up, they took three hours to enter the building, but the shooting was already over, and that was the number 10 on the list. I could go to 15, I could go to 20, but every time you will find that the shootings always ended when somebody was confronted with armed force. Either they perceived it, they knew it was coming, so they ended themselves. <sighs> now, I have three events that involved shootings before 1980 that I felt were notable and that I came across in my research. Now, this one actually, this shooting involved explosives, and the explosives actually caused the majority of the casualties. There were 44 dead, with one at another location, 58 injured, and it's, it, uh, this happened in 1927. The idea of a gun-free zone just didn't exist back then, so no, it wasn't a gun-free zone. But it ended when the shooter was confronted, and he committed suicide by shooting explosives and blowing himself and a few other people up. There were 44 dead and 58 injured at the Bath, Michigan school. Now, we do have another shooting that, was at, that technically wasn't a gun-free zone at the time. It is now. Well, kind of. And it's fixing to not be in general. There'll be small parts of it that are still gun-free zones, but not the entirety of it as it has been for the most part. But in a way, it still was a gun-free zone because people couldn't carry for self-defense. Long story, this happened in Texas before the concealed carry program. But you had people that had hunting rifles in their vehicles. You had nearby shop owners that had firearms. And yes, I'm talking about the University of Texas tower shooting that happened in 1966. This happened on August 1st. 
Now, there were 17 dead, and one of them died years later uh, from wounds that he sustained from the shooting. If he hadn't been shot, he would have lived longer, and there were 32 injured. Now, the shooting ended when law enforcement and a civilian, all of them had guns, went up and confronted him. Well, confronted and killed him. Now, I've kind of alluded to this, but I want to come out and straight up say it. Hunting rifles were used by students and others to return fire at the tower. Now, this forced the killer to take cover, and it prevented more injuries and deaths. And as I said, uh, an armed civilian, in this case it was a pharmacist, went up the clock tower with law enforcement to confront the killer. Now, this, this next one, and this is the last one I felt was notable, it would have made the list except it happened over several days. <sighs> this would be the Russellville, Arkansas uh, slains. There were 16 dead. And four injured. And it did happen in gun free zone in a gun free zone for some of the killings. Some of these happened at the shooter's house, so he was technically not in a gun free zone in that case for him. However, at the time, only law enforcement was allowed to carry in Arkansas. Now this shooting ended when the uh, suspect surrendered to police without any resistance when he was finished killing his victims. In fact, while he waited for the police, he sat down and chatted up one of the secretaries at the final crime scene. As I said, this event took place over several days, and there were multiple methods used to kill people. This happened from December 22nd, 1987, through December 28th, 1987. Well, let's take a quick look, okay? On all these that happened after 1980, they ended only when people with guns got involved. Most of the time, the shooter was killed or he committed suicide. They all happened in gun-free zones. Now think about this. You have the 10 deadliest shootings happening, or the 10 deadliest shootings since 1980. They have all happened in gun-free zones. The killer has nearly always committed suicide or been killed by law enforcement, with one exception that I, that I took note of. The only ones that actually fight to the death are typically ones that are doing it for political or terroristic reasons. You go back to the ones before 1980, one of them happened before gun-free zones were actually in effect, and the other two happened in virtual gun-free zones, although they, it wasn't entirely gun-free zones. In only one of these did the, did the shooter face fire from the civilians or his potential victims. Only one of these, and that was the University of Texas tower shooting. This is a case where... The civilians returned fire with hunting rifles because they couldn't carry handguns for self-defense, and the shooter was using a rifle, and it wasn't a scary so-called assault rifle. This was what most people would consider a modern hunting rifle. Fire was going both directions. The shooter was kept pinned down until law enforcement and an armed pharmacist could go up there and put an end to it on a more permanent basis. Now, if he hadn't had people shooting back at him, odds are he would have been laying in wait when law enforcement made it up the tower, or he would have shot them as they approached the tower in the first place. There would have probably been more dead because he could have kept his rate of fire up. He could have kept killing people unopposed. But because he was opposed, the casualties were limited. And the worst one that happened, other than Orlando, and this is including the notable exceptions, actually used explosives for the majority of the casualties. This shows the fallacy of gun-free zones, this shows the fallacy of limiting what people can have to defend themselves. If you tell people they can only have sticks, rocks, and pocket knives, if they're lucky on the pocket knives thing, to defend themselves, and a bad guy shows up with an AR-15 or a bolt-action rifle, it brings back to mind the, the uh, statement, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. He may not have any depth perception, but at least he can see where no one else can. Well, let's look at the idea of a new so-called assault weapons ban. Now, when the original sunset in 2004, it did not increase crime. In fact, crime has fallen while the AR-15 has been the number one best-selling firearm in America. There are millions of so-called assault weapons in non-government hands. And unless we, can, unless we go to the lengths to confiscate these existing rifles, you will still see these weapons in, the, in use in the public. In fact, I would say that confiscation would most likely result in, in the majority of these firearms being lost in fishing accidents or outright rebellion. And I'd also like to know, 
Why are magazines that hold 11 rounds more dangerous than magazines that hold 10? Why are magazines that hold 15 rounds more dangerous than 10 round magazines? It makes no sense to me. I'd also like to point out the difference between so-called assault weapons and just generic semi-auto hunting rifles is almost always cosmetic and or ergonomic. I'll be honest, an AR-15 with a pistol grip is far more ergonomic than a, I don't know, let's take a Mini-14 with a wood stock and no, uh, no pistol grip shape in that wood stock. Now, Fox, New- Fox News has an article, and they have a list of mass shootings, and their article is about Obama returns to efforts to ban assault weapons, or so-called assault weapons, but their article says mass shootings are when four or more people are killed, but they count shootings with as few as three fatalities. That's not biased, is it? Then you have the terror and no-fly watch list ban. They are really pushing this one because this this shooter at the Orlando nightclub, he wasn't even on the terror watch list when he committed these shootings. He was on it, and then he was taken off. But the problem everybody has with a terror or no-fly watch list ban, there's no due process to get on this, to be put on this list. There's no notification process for those placed on the list, which would kind of defeat the purpose of placing somebody on it. Hey, we're putting you on the terrorist watch list, so you better watch yourself and don't do anything that we find suspicious because we might just investigate further and determine you are a terrorist, if you really are. There's no published or standard method of getting your name removed from the list. You pretty much have to discover you're on it, fight through the court system, and maybe, if you're lucky, get your name off the list. Alternatively, if your name is uh, Muslim sounding, you might get removed just to make the list more politically correct without having to do anything, even if you are an actual terrorist. Now, there's also no process to check if you're actually on this list. And there and even if you could check to see if you're on the list, there's no process to actually correct any errors either. Now, I'm going to throw in a few links to resources that you can use to do your own research. These will include a link in the show notes to the Crime Prevention Research Center, gunfacts.info. I'm also going to throw in an article to slate.com on a 2013 CDC report that was ordered by the Obama administration. Now, the report does reflect some political positions. But there are facts and numbers of value in this report. The article also shows how the same demands, suggestions, and tired old lies are reused by the anti-gun crowd. Also, an article by Politico.com points out why we can't trust CDC research on firearms, just to give you a little bit more of a fair and balanced approach to it. And finally, it's not going to be in the resources for your own research, but it'll be in the show notes. I'm going to throw in a link to the Operation Blazing Sword and... It looks like that'll go to their Facebook page. With that said, I'm going to run the audio that tells you how to get in touch with me, and then we'll come back and we'll hit the news segment. If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com, or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. Our news girl, whose name shall remain unspoken and uh, unmade up, has quite a few stories for us. She actually sent me something like 20, and I kind of cut it back. She probably won't be happy, but I did. I cut it back to about eight. Our first story comes in in the criminal activity category. Just days after the Orlando terrorist attack, and that's really what it was, a man took hostages at an Amarillo, Texas Walmart. Now, this man was an immigrant from Iran, so there's probably a name that sounds like it's from a certain religion involved, although this incident reportedly stems from the suspect being passed over for promotion and is not reportedly considered to be a case of terrorism. However, two deputies were injured in the event, and the suspect was killed by law enforcement. And apparently that's the only injuries. Moving on, most of our stories are going to be in the politics category. And we'll hit the first one, which is an article titled, Texas Lawmakers Likely to Expand Where People Can Take Guns. Now, while the article is full of speculation, it acknowledges that Texas lawmakers understand the concept that gun-free zones are actually nothing more than what I'm calling them now, killing spree zones. Moving on, 
Open Carry Texas has offered to provide a visibly armed escort for any LGBT events in the state. However, according to OCT's Facebook page, this PR stunt has reportedly run afoul of the state of Texas security service industry, and OCT will simply hold a concurrent event if they are invited, which to my knowledge, they haven't been invited to any of these events. If they had been, you could be certain they'd have it plastered all over their Facebook page, press releases, and things like that. After all, if they can't get their name in the news, they're not doing something right. Then we have another article that's titled, East Texas Gun Store Owners Say Federal Laws Are Not Highly Enforced. Now, this actually echoes what gun rights activists have been saying all along, and the article features an interview with a gun store owner who is a former law enforcement officer. Now, this uh, gun store owner reports that the FBI has denied purchase or they have denied purchases days after the delay has defaulted to a proceed. When they learn that the uh, gun store has proceeded after the delay has defaulted, the FBI then requests information on the buyer. And the article also points out that less than one-tenth of one percent of denials on firearm purchases are actually prosecuted. Think about that. That means for every thousand denials, one might be prosecuted. What they're saying is less than that. So let's say you have 5,000 denials in a year. Of those 5,000 denials, maybe five, but it'll be less than five. It might be four, it might be one, but it'll be less than five out of 5,000. Now you can say it's a sign of how wrong gun banners are when the ACLU's blog has an article that agrees with gun owners in general and the NRA in particular. Well, for the most part agrees. In this case, the ACLU states on their blog that until it is fixed, the no-fly list should not be used to restrict people's freedoms. Hmm, hasn't the NRA, the NSSF, and other gun rights groups and manufacturers groups actually said the same thing? Weird. You know, Americans, including the ACLU, is real big on that whole um, due process thing. Just kind of throwing that out there. Now, continuing on the no-fly list uh, line, it appears that U.S. Marshals routinely place innocent people on the no-fly list in order to meet quotas so that they can receive bonuses, get promotions, as well as get awards and special assignments. This is according to an article found on the DenverChannel.com website. I definitely recommend you read that one. That'll be the last story in the, poli- in the politics category in the new- show notes. Finally, we're going to have two articles listed in the gun sales category. And the first one, basically... As usual, a highly publicized mass shooting has resulted in yet another run on guns and ammunition across the country, as evidenced by this article about the Russians in Central Texas gun stores. I'm going to point out, my Marlin 1895, I picked it up before the shooting, but I was looking for reloading supplies, mostly for the 4570 and the 10 millimeter. And when I say reloading supplies, I mean powder. And while I was looking for powder, I was in a gun store in Odessa. No, 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 no. It wasn't Odessa. It was Midland. Was it? I was in a gun store in Midland. I'd been in gun stores in Odessa, but I'd made my circuit and moved on into from Odessa to Midland. I found both powders I was looking for. But they had a pretty good price. And while I was looking around, just getting a general idea of what all the gun store had, prices, and a general feel of the atmosphere, I saw two people buy AR-15s. One bought an AR-15 pistol, one bought a, well, not a high-end, but an upper mid, mid-range AR-15. It's amazing how, how these uh, shootings like this will push people to buy guns that might be banned later. If you think for an instant that you're going to push through a ban and confiscate these firearms when people are rushing out to buy them before you can, think about it. Are these people likely to give these things up easily? I don't think so. Now, moving on to our final article and the second one in the gun sales category. Gun sales are up for members of the LGBTQ community in Austin, Texas, according to an article from KITV, K-E-Y-E-T-V dot com. Additionally, the article mentions that the, or mentions that Austin is in the process of getting a chapter of the pink pistols, and I'll throw a link to them in that, um, in the show notes there. It'll, It'll probably be the name Pink Pistols is going to become clickable as a link. Now, the Pink Pistols is a gun rights group dedicated to issues specific to the LGBTQ community. Folks, I'm going to say it. Gun-free zones are nothing but killing spree zones. 
all they do is enable criminals, terrorists, and just general murders to go about unchecked until law enforcement shows up. We have, from 1980 to 2016, we have over 30 years where the 10 deadliest shootings all happen in a gun-free zone. Think about that. Three notable mentions all happened in gun-free zones or partial gun-free zones, except for one before there was any such thing as a gun-free zone. And that one used a lot of explosives for the majority of the casualties. The shooters all went in with the intent to die. Most of them committed suicide. A few fought to the death. Most of them were terrorists. And only one was captured alive, except for one that happened uh, in 1987, where he actually sat down and waited for the police after he finished killing his victims. And that wasn't even a mass shooting. That was a shooting that happened over several days. So with two exceptions, all these killers went in with the intent to die. Think about that. You have somebody going in with the intent to commit murder, kill as many people as they can, and they don't intend to stop until they die. This is not normal, sane social behavior. This is a case where somebody is either off their rocker, off their medication, or they're off on some crazy, I believe that the only way I can spread my religion is by killing a bunch of people that don't believe in it. It's all insane. It's all stupidity. And it's stupidity that we do not allow people to carry a weapon to defend themselves because they might decide to kill somebody. Well, you know what? If they decide to kill somebody, telling them they can't have a gun is not going to keep them from doing it. It obviously fails. Let me tell you how bad it failed. Gun-free zones failed 49 times fatally in Orlando, Florida at the Pulse nightclub. If they failed 32 times fatally at Virginia Tech. They failed 27 times fatally at Sandy Hook. In Colleen, Texas, just outside of Fort Hood, they failed 23 times. In San Isidro, California, gun-free zones failed 21 times. In San Bernardino, California, gun-free zones failed 14 times. And these are all fatal. Edmond, Oklahoma, 14 times. Fort Hood, 13 failures for U.S. Army soldiers who, if they'd had a firearm, there's no doubt in my mind or anyone else's that they could have fought this guy and won if only one of them had possessed a weapon. In Binghamton, New York, 13 fatal failures for gun-free zones. Think about it. Those last three failures, or the last three groups of failures, resulted in 39. And this is only 10 events. Gun-free zones are not gun-free zones. If they were, the bad guys wouldn't have guns. No. Gun-free zones are killing spree zones. Face it. Accept it. End it. That's all I gotta say. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. Okay, I had my after show rant right there just before the end credits. Oh, well, I want to say I'm not saying we need gun control. I'm saying we need to end gun control. We need to end these killing spree zones. We need to find a way to educate the public that these events are preventable. These instances are unacceptable and that these numbers don't have to get this high ever again. There's no doubt about it in my mind that if these shooters had been confronted by someone in the supp- supposed gun-free zone with a firearm that their mass killing would have stopped. You don't believe me? Look up Gina Som, former law enforcement officer. She was carrying under the authority of a concealed handgun license, and she had an active shooter show up at her church. She engaged him. He was wounded and committed suicide. Same exact formula. He went into what he thought was a gun-free zone. Turns out it wasn't. Someone else had a gun. He was stopped. With that said, stay safe, carry responsibly, and get ready. The fight for gun rights 
is about to get really serious. You're seeing it in the Congress at the federal level. I guarantee you will see a lot of legislation attempt to be filed or attempt to be passed when the 2017 Texas legislative session starts. And we got to be ready. We have to be ready because if we're not, we're going to get steamrolled. 